With any operations test, they always have something to do with fitness. Talking about fitness, explaining why it's important to be fit. Usually when we talk about some sort of operations questions, when they're getting into fitness, they always like to use how to pick something or someone up. Don't bend at your waist. You're going to be bending with your legs where your palms are going to be up and your feet are always going to be shoulder width apart. Disinfecting your equipment, there's very commonly not just questions about checking out your equipment, but also when to clean your equipment. The actual definition of disinfecting is killing of pathogenic agents by directly applying chemicals made for the purpose of killing those pathogenic agents. When should we be cleaning our equipment? You should be cleaning the equipment that patients touch the first thing that you do in the morning or that first call that you have everything should be cleaned and after every single call all your equipment that touched the patient needs to be disinfected that doesn't mean we're going to take soap and water to everything but we are going to take a disinfecting cleaner and spray everything down or you're going to have alcohol wipes that are going to wipe all the pieces of equipment down that either you touch or the patient touches. Make sure you do it. This is something big too with regards to equipment. You should be washing your hands. This drives me nuts, especially with students, uh, new people that come into EMS. Once you are done with a call, please wash your hands, soap and water. More and more studies are coming out to say that with warm water and just soap, you can kill most bacterias and you actually reduce the chances of yourself getting sick by a lot. Okay. So make sure you're washing your hands, make sure you're doing your part to keep yourself healthy and safe. Disposing of sharps and biohazards. Uh, whenever you use a sharp, it's got to go into a sharps container. You can't just put it into a trash can. Now with regards to biohazards, what the heck should be going into those bins? Blood soaked items not vomit, not feces, not anything else other than blood soaked items or blood saturated items should be going into those. Trust me, I work in EMS. I know what we put in those things. Everything we eat like a sandwich and throw the wrapper into the biohazard bin. Your department will be paying for that. And it's paid by weight. Most things that we deal with in EMS should be thrown into a regular trash can. Kind of doesn't happen that way. I think that is uh, something that needs to be changed. Okay. Got all that stuff out of the way. Let's talk about some more fun things. Responding to the call. Who has the right of way when you're responding to a call? Whoever has the right of way in traffic has the right of way. You doesn't mean you, just because you have lights and sirens on, that doesn't mean that you have the right of way to do whatever you want on the street. If you, for example, come up to a red light, we need to come to a complete stop at the red light, even though it looks like all the traffic has stopped for you. Come to a complete stop. You're going to go ahead and look left, look right, make sure you make eye contact with drivers, and you can proceed slowly and cautiously through the intersection. Do not just rush through intersections. This is how bad things happen. School zones. You do not have the right to speed through a school zone. If school zones say 15 miles per hour, you're going 15 miles per hour. And trust me when I tell you, that shit is awkward as hell with your lights and sirens. You're going 15 miles an hour and everyone's staring at you. Just turn it off. Move 15 miles an hour. Hopefully people will get out of your way. That's just the way it is. And last but not least, are we using lights and sirens or should we not? When we talk about priority calls or uh, some sort of critical call, that's when we're using lights and sirens. Okay, We're using lights and sirens to get to the call because we don't technically know what's happening unless they call and tell us, hey, we're not injured. We just need assistance up, something of that sort. We call that code one. Code one just means no lights, no sirens, and it's just routine response. We're just driving over there. You got to stop wet red lights. You stop, you know, and you're just a regular driver. When we're writing code three, Code three means lights and sirens. Um, in most EMS settings, there should be no code two. Uh, you shouldn't be able to just drive around with lights, but no sirens. And the reason behind that is if you do get into an accident, whose fault is it? The other person that you accidentally crash into is just going to say, oh, I, I didn't see, I didn't hear them. You're like, well, I had our lights on and we're driving, but you, for you to be the safest at driving code three, you need to have your lights and your sirens on simultaneously when you're responding to a call or to the hospital with a patient.